And we lived in Montana, and we practically lived what is called on the Continental Divide. Do you know what the Continental Divide is? It's that prominent ridge of mountains that determines which way the water will flow after it hits the earth. If it, the precipitation falls on the way, and you know, this is great, I'm talking about precipitation. We need it, don't we? I mean, that's why I wore my, my Noah's Ark tie, hopefully inspire some precipitation. But uh, if it hits on the western side of the Continental D Divide, that water is going to flow to the Pacific Ocean. If it goes, falls to the eastern side, then it goes to the Gulf of Mexico and eventually to the Atlantic Ocean. I spent the first 25 years of my life on the eastern side of the Continental D Divide, and then the next 25 years on the western side of the Continental D Divide. That's why I'm so balanced. Yeah. Mm. But the Continental Divide, it stretches all the way from Canada all the way to Mexico. But it's not a straight line. You might imagine it being a straight line, but it actually takes some quite some interesting uh, turns. It passes just east of Butte, Montana, and we were living just west of Butte, Montana, before it weaves its way back along the Idaho border and then, through, then into Wyoming. And, and if you look on the map, it's quite a complicated uh, path it takes. And I thought about the, con the Continental Divide when I was reading these, these ending verses of chapter 6 of Genesis and that first verse of chapter 7. Because you can really take a look at those and like there's a divide there, it's sort of the same divide, or a, I'll call it a rift, in, in the understanding of basic religion. There's a significant rift there. And for la lack of a better term, it has... It is, it's the way people understand faith in general. And we need to make sure we're on the right side of this divide. Now, before I go into the details about this rift, let me add a couple thoughts that you might be entertaining. And that is, first of all, Pastor, let's not talk about differences. Okay, we, sometimes we, are, we shy away from that sort of thing, especially in this culture we live in today, in politics or the race divide that there seems to be ginning up, or an age divide, generation divide, or a culture divide, or an economic divide, even education. And you might be saying, Pastor, why pile on with all these divisions? Let's, let's, let's focus on what we have in common. And I would say that's a good thing too, but, but my answer to this is twofold. First, I hear you in that you want to maintain harmony. I mean, we, we, we don't like to live under conflict, do we? And I'm, I'm a person who, I, frankly, I would run away from conflict. I don't like conflict. I, I mean, those who like conflict are those who, who like to stir up trouble, typically. But I'm not one of them. I love peace. I love harmony. Just ask my wife. She knows what great lengths I will go to to, some, to maintain peace. Now my kids are probably laughing down here and probably say that's not true. But what, pr what price are you willing to pay for peace? Sometimes we pay a small price. For example, maybe I offend my wife. If I say to her, I'm sorry, and I and admit my wrongdoing, and maybe, you know, do my share of the dishes, you know, that peace and harmony will come back. And so that's a small price to pay to have that, to have that harmony. But what if, what if getting that peace and harmony means you have to, you have to compromise on principles that you hold near and dear to you? You might have to... Ab would you be willing to abandon your principles in order for peace? Is that price, is that worth it? I, I returned to my a moment in Montana once. I remember one Sunday morning, I was busy teaching Sunday school, and uh, that peace and harmony in the church was kind of broken in a crazy way because someone off the street had brought in some um, some political papers and set them on the back table and I didn't know this I was busy doing something else and they just came in without permission and set them on the back table well one couple who likes to vote one way saw them and they were completely offended and they started accusing another family in the church because they knew they voted a different way and before you knew it people were running out of the church never to come back for a long time 
It was a very, and this happened just a few minutes before the church service. So people were coming up to me just before worship service and complaining to me about what happened there. What was the lesson there? Was it just part of it says make sure you see what's, what's on the back table of the church. That's one thing, you know. Make sure you properly see. It wasn't anything too dramatic, really. It wasn't, uh, it was just like a, a voter information packet, which was, I thought was, was okay. But the real lesson in that whole thing there was that peace and harmony and unity in the church can be very elusive and very fragile, especially when people forget about God's gift of the Holy Spirit. See, our peace is broken and harmony is broken real quickly when people are not living under the guidance of the Holy Spirit in their lives. We all have our own ideas, don't we? We have our own thoughts. We have our own experiences. We have our own way of wanting to do things. And this is good. Or it could be bad. But if we're willing to rely on God's guidance and the Holy Spirit in our lives, then good things can come out of that. In other words, God's gift of the Holy Spirit in the church, it's indispensable. We have to have it. If we don't have it, we have no hope of getting along with each other. We don't have any hope of getting anything done. The Holy Spirit helps us to love one another, to help us understand one another, to accept one another, even when we have those different ideas, even when we come from different backgrounds. God's Spirit in the church and our willingness to to submit to the Holy Spirit, that's as important as water to a fish or to the air in which a bird flies, flies through the sky. We, as a Christian, our environment has to be the Holy Spirit. It it helps us to conduct our activities throughout the day. And without Him, well, you know, without the Holy Spirit, we're better left staying away from other people, to be honest with you. But the second, my second response is, why should I address the differences rather than, You know, why should I address those rather than avoid them? Is the fact is that truth is involved and truth is is objective and is indispensable for life. When I say objective, I mean each of us may respond to the truth differently, but our response never changes the truth. indispensable in that our response to the truth will determine really our destiny. Jesus said that if we respond to the truth positively, he says the truth will set us free. Think about the parable of Jesus when he spoke to the chief priests and the Pharisees who really wanted to to do away with Jesus. And, he, and in his parable, he spoke of a vineyard and how the, the owner of the vineyard uh, uh, and his son were going to you know, collect the fruit and how the tenants killed the owner's son. In his parable, God is the owner of the vineyard. Jesus is the son who was sent. And, and this is an absolute non-negotiable truth in our world. But the way the religious leaders responded to that truth, it was disheartening to say the least, wasn't it? The religious leaders did not respond correctly to the truth, but they rejected the truth of God's Son, and because of it, Jesus pronounced judgment on them and said, he on whom the stone falls will be crushed. So there's the truth. Do you receive it? Do you reject it? And your destiny hangs in the balance. Truth is like the continental divide out there. Where where do we fall on the divide? How will we respond to the truth? That will determine our destiny, our spiritual destiny, our eternal destiny. The second, second, some might be thinking that if this rift you're speaking of, Pastor, falls into the realm of religious ideas, then really then that's pretty much irrelevant. 
This is the way the world views religion these days. Some see religion as archaic. Some see it as anti-intellectual. Some see it as out of touch with reality. All these things. And they say, let's focus our energy on practical solutions, not on a pie-in-the-sky, philosophical rainbow sort of thing. But the truth of the matter is, our belief system dictates our behavior. How we believe in our heart will will determine how we're going to act in life and how we're going to relate to one another. And it's in our thoughts where we consider consciously or unconsciously the ideas about God and our relationship with Him. And if we come to the conclusion that God is nothing more than a figment of our imagination or that mankind has no soul or has no value... Where's there to, where is it there are we going to, is going to stop us from doing harm to another individual or to ourselves? Throughout the Bible, what are we continually reminded of? That humanity is valuable. That humanity is worth forgiving. Humanity is worth helping and, and saving despite our spiritual condition we're in. And so for better or worse, religion plays a key role in this, in the sense that it's the initial framework through which we begin to relate to God and to relate to one another. That's why I'm so thrilled and happy that these young people would want to be involved in church. Bless Llewellyn's heart. Every every Sunday she's here, rain or shine, helping those kids understand the Bible. I mean, my part, what do I do? I bring the donuts, okay? But she's in there. She's bringing the real spiritual food. And James made that point when he wrote, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and flawless, look after the orphans and the widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And so from this short verse, we readily recognize the personal moral aspect of faith. Keep oneself pure. And the social side of it, loving our neighbor, okay? Both deal, what do they deal with? Very practical, real-world issues that we must wrestle with every day. How will I treat my neighbor? How will I conduct myself as it relates to the good and the evil of the world? Our faith in God will help us do that. So what I'm saying here is our view of God impacts every aspect of our lives, whether we realize it or not. So this brings me to the discussion of this rift I was talking about. And it's namely this. Do our good works make us righteous before God? Or does God make us righteous? That's a big question there. In other words, is God's favor something we have to earn? Or is it a gift that we, by faith, receive? Again, many of us may not grasp the gravity of this question. And you might say, well, you're just splitting hairs. But I can assure you that this issue is of grave importance. In fact, how we answer the question will directly impact how we operate in life and how we perceive God. Do I earn God's favor or do I receive God's favor by faith? Let me give you an example of how how I'm trying to work this out here. And that is, let's say your employer calls you up Saturday, early Saturday morning and wakes you out of a peaceful slumber to tell you you have to report to work today, even though it is your regular day off. Would you go to work? I bet 99% of you would drag yourself out of bed and go to work out of loyalty for your employer. But what if he also said you would not be getting paid to come in on that day? Would you still go in? My guess is that many of you would not. You would pull the covers over your head and uh, go back to sleep. Why? Well, probably because we've all been taught that the worker deserves his wages, right? That seems logical. 
Naturally, if we go into work and do what the boss tells us to do, we expect to get paid. If we're not going to get paid, we're probably not going to show up, are we? But let's say, let's say you don't know, but you, you, you decide to go to work anyway, even though the, 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 your employer says you're not going to get paid for this, but you've got to come in. Now let's say two weeks pass, and, I'll, and you receive your paycheck, and it's bigger than usual. Now what are you going to say about that? You're going to say, wow, that is a wonderful gift, that our extra gift I received, or my paycheck. You're probably not going to say that. You're going to say, oh, my employer had a second thought and decided he was going to pay me for the work anyway because I went in on that day. The bottom line is we wouldn't see that extra money as a gift. We'd see it as fair compensation for our work rendered, something we were owed, that we earned. And the reason I, asked that, the reason I brought that analogy up is that we, this is the way we view our relationship with God a lot. He is the employer, and just because we view this way, I'm not saying it's the right way. He is our employer, we are his employee, and we get from God, and what we get from God is being a good worker for God. That's what we say in our mind a lot of times. But is that how the Bible teaches? Not at all. The sad, fact is, the sad fact is that there's whole denominations of churches out there that, and not to mention even other religions, I'm not just talking about Christianity, I'm talking about the religions that operate on this principle. We must work our way into a right relationship with God. And that salvation can be ours if we just work a little harder. A lot of, a lot of, Religions teach that. After all, isn't God in the business of rewarding his employees? Just make the pilgrimage. Just donate to the building fund. Just visit the confession. And God will pay you what you are owed. But like I said, this is completely anti-biblical. Look what Paul writes about in Romans chapter 4. He says, Ad Abraham... If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. Now, when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift. That's an obligation. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited to him, credited to him as righteousness. So now we can clearly, clearly see the rift. And, I, and I've called it today the, the continental divide. We either believe God's, that God gives righteousness to us freely and fully when we trust in God's Son's supreme act of sacrifice on the cross, Jesus. We believe in His work or we buy into the false notion that if we could just do a few more good things in our lives, if we could just somehow earn God's favor and tip the scale toward salvation rather than condemnation. It was cute this morning, I asked, the kids were reciting their Bible memory verse. And we didn't, I, I'm not sure I got an answer to this, but I asked the kids, what is condemnation? So I, I'll have to get back to that. I'll have to get back to you on that, on their answer. That's a big word, though. But do you see the cataclysmic shift here in thought? Do you see the continental divide? Either God does the work to procure our righteousness, or we do. On which side of the continental divide will you fall? Some people will get all self-righteous and proclaim, well, I'm not going to have anybody pay my way. I'm going to do it myself. But be forewarned, the debt we owe to God can never be repaid. We're in too deep. We have neither the personal will or the strength or the resources to become debt free. Now, some of you might be asking, what does this have to do with the Genesis chapter 622 and, 
in Genesis chapter 7, verse 1. In verse 22, we read that Noah was perfectly obedient to God's commands to build an ark. And Moses records that Noah did everything just as God commanded. And in the following verse, in chapter 7, verse 1, God found Noah righteous in his generation. As a matter of fact, it says, Go into the ark, Noah, and your whole family, because I found you righteous in this generation. Is Noah going to be saved based on his works? Because he built the ark? After all, did not Noah build the very structure that would eventually save he and his family? And now God is affirming in the scripture, saying, Noah's righteousness because of his good works that he performed, could we not possibly take away from this scripture and say that we can be saved by our good works? If we say that, well, we would be, we would be wrong. We need, and here's a good reminder here, that a crucial interpretive uh, principle of understanding the Bible is that we need to take into the whole counsel of God before we come to a conclusion. Don't rely on a single text to come up with your, with your conclusion. With this in mind, I, I, we turn to Hebrews 11, verse 7. It says this, By faith, Noah was warned about things, not un, things unseen. In holy fear, he built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness. That comes, that comes by faith. Notice that in that one verse, we have three references to faith. By faith, Noah built the ark. By faith, he condemned the world. In other words, he demonstrated that in building the ark, he was proving God true when the waters came. The things that the world said just laughed at him. And Noah, it says, became heir of the righteousness that comes from faith. In other words, his faith, Noah's faith, afforded him and positioned him to receive God's gift of life. The gift of being in God's favor under his protection. Is it possible that the author of Hebrews was confronted basically with the same question I have confronted with you this morning? What saved Noah? The work of his own hands or the faith he put in God? Well, there can be only one answer to that question. And it will determine the direction of your own personal life. Either you continue to count on your own works believing that God's righteousness is something that must be earned. If you go this route, there will always be a cloud of uncertainty above your head. Have I done enough to appease God? He's the ultimate one who judges the living and the, living and the dead. There will all be a, always a cloud of vagueness. Do I have to do one more important good thing? Or instead, will you fall on the other side of the continental divide and embrace the biblical truth and be set free knowing that believing true righteousness can be ours when we finally realize and embrace the truth that Jesus has already done the work for us. That he paid our debt by his work on the cross. All we have to do as Christians is to believe it, to receive it, with thanksgiving in our hearts. I refer you to Romans chapter 3, 21, to prove my point. But now a righteousness from God is apart from the law. A righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness comes from God through faith in Jesus to all who believe. There is no difference, Paul writes, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but we are justified freely by his grace because of the work of Christ on the cross.
believe in God's work on the cross. That is our salvation. That is life. That is the side that you want to fall on. If you want your eternal destiny, your eternal life to be with God in heaven.